All right. Well, hello, everybody. Good to see y'all. And uh, thanks for tuning in to our uh, Wednesday night study, uh, Experiencing God at Home. And uh, this is the study where we're going to be looking at going through the book, Experiencing God at Home by Tom and uh, Richard Blackaby. And um, it's been a, a good study so far. Everything, uh, you know, there's been a lot of really good information um, that they've talked about in the book and a lot of things that are very, uh, very worthwhile in uh, considering for our own families. So we're just going to give everybody just a minute to log in and uh, I'm going to share this on our church Facebook page so people will be able to watch there as well. Uh, this Wednesday tonight we're looking at chapters 5 and 6 in the book experiencing God at home and uh, we're going to be talking about what those uh, what those two chapters entail and going into more some more detail about that but let's give everybody just about another minute uh, to log on uh, hope that y'all are doing well and uh, hope that you and your family are doing okay in this quarantine and in these days of social distancing at least some Restaurants are opening back up and that sort of thing. I hope that's a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, um, it's it's a good thing to be able to support, especially our local economy. Um, that's, I think, very important uh, in times like these. So hopefully folks will, um, not too many folks will lose, lose their jobs here locally and that sort of thing. Uh, but again, we're looking at chapters 5 and 6 tonight. And uh, looking at experiencing God at home by Tom and Richard Blackaby. I want to share just a little bit about the um, about our, I guess, our model for teaching this in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're going to look at one more profile study tonight of Tom Blackaby's family that he shares about with uh, the relationships between. Uh, him and his wife and their kids and the relationships, the, fa the uh, family dynamics that they bring uh, and that they've navigated through. And then we'll look at the uh, seven principles of the original experience in God's study. They're going to do a broad overview of what that was that uh, Henry Blackaby wrote about so long ago. Uh, and then basically for the most part, the rest of the book is about application. It's about applying those seven principles of experiencing God, applying it to the home. And so when we get to that part, especially about the application and everything, uh, I'm, I'm going to use Zoom, but it'll still play here on our Facebook group and on Facebook Live on our, um, on our church Facebook page. But what I'm going to do is uh, basically ask a, a couple of different people to come on with me and to share their perspective about some of these things and uh, to kind of help me teach um, in those of y'all that are teachers call it co-teaching and so we'll kind of plan that out a little bit uh, but it could be an opportunity for you if you feel led to uh, to share just a little bit about your family and family dynamics and that sort of thing and biblically how uh, you know what you think about what's the, what the book's talking about and how that applies to your own scenario or your own family. That'd be a great opportunity. But I'm going to be reaching out to some folks and uh, seeing if they'll help to maybe just provide some insight and we'll we'll kind of share some responsibility in in teaching through this, or at least at the very least in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be getting some other perspective um, on how this applies to individual families. And so that's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping that you'll be able to see in these next couple of weeks and as we apply the seven principles of experiencing God, experiencing that in our homes and how you know critically important that really is for uh, us as believers in these days. Uh, it, I'm just reminded by all of this that has happened and everything that has taken place, I'm reminded that really the home is central headquarters it is the epicenter of life and um, especially in our society I mean um, how how the home goes so goes society I mean that's basically I think what happens what what takes place in the home is eventually going to impact society as a whole and you know you know days like 
now where many people are working from home, they're staying at home, um, they're getting things done in their home, their kids are being educated at home. Um, it, it's just a, a real uh, good reminder, I think, for us of, of just how important the home really is and how important it is that we apply biblical principles, not just in our spiritual life at church, if we're leaders in the church or if we're teaching Sunday school class or whatever else that it may be, but applying those biblical principles in every aspect of our life, but especially in our homes. Uh, before I can ever pastor Saga Baptist Church in Cedartown, I have to be a pastor here on Joy Lane. I have to be a pastor to, uh, to my family here, and I have to apply these same principles and live out these principles with them, with Sarah, Jack, and Maggie. And so before I can ever pastor anybody else, really, I mean, it's important in that role, but it's important for all of us um, that we think about how we lead our families, how we uh, instill biblical values in the home, instill biblical values in our children and our grandchildren to better prepare them for uh, what is to come. All right, so that's the plan moving forward is um, we're looking at today we are looking at you know another profile study of of their family tom blackaby and then we'll get into the seven principles of experiencing god at home Uh, and then in the next few weeks we'll have some people come in and join us on facebook live uh, to basically share a little bit about their perspective and uh, what they are how they're applying this in in their own home. All right, so to begin with, was chapter five uh, is about Tom Blackaby's family, and it's just a general overview again of um, of the types of struggles that they've had, the personalities that individual people in the family have, uh, how their personalities are different between he and his wife, um, and how how important that is that they navigate through that well, but then. I think it's also, I think what's really, really helpful in this, you know, and why they spend a couple of chapters talking about their own families and in, you know, me using personal examples with, with my own family, one of the things that, one of the things that I think is so important in all of this is that we don't strive for uniformity. Uh, in fact, it's not really even biblical in the sense. I mean, and, and what I mean by that is that God has created you as a unique individual. God has created your children and your grandchildren, each unique in their own distinct ways. And so while we, while we want to strive for the same biblical values and we want to strive for uh, teaching and raising our children and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, that is that is the goal for every Christian family, and there should be uh, there should be unity in reaching that goal and, and how you do that. But 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 we can't forget the fact that God has created us as unique individuals, and so uh, there is there's going to be people in your family that are different than you. Maybe your wife or your husband they're different than you. Your spouse is. Uh, maybe your children are different. Maybe they're raised in a different uh, circumstance or different scenario than you were raised in or that your spouse was raised in. And that's all right. I mean, there there's going to be differences about each and every person in our family. I mean, you've heard about, you know, people being the black sheep of their family. Well, I mean, we're all different in so many ways. And uh, so the goal is not uniformity. The goal is not the goal is not to conform to what we think our children should look and do and be interested in. The goal is to instill biblical values in them no matter what direction they take in life. And that could be based on their giftedness, that could be based on uh, what their skill sets are, that could be based on what they're interested in. I mean, I think I've mentioned before, Jack is really loving basketball. He just, I mean, he absolutely loves basketball. And I have... I could probably count how many times I've actually picked up a basketball in my entire life. <laughs> and I'm not the most sports oriented person, but Jack, Jack loves it. He loves football. He loves basketball. And, uh, he's, he's really interested in it. And so I, you know, my goal as a dad is, is not to shy away from that. I mean, I want to be interested in the things that he's interested in. Uh, my goal as a dad is to try to hone in on those things uh, and maybe some things that God is going to naturally gift him with 
and try to instill biblical values along the way that's going to grow him in whatever uh, whatever avenue he takes in life. And the same the same with Maggie. I used to kid uh, before Maggie was born. I used to kid Sarah and say, uh, "Now it's going to be funny if if we have a girl and she turns out to be a tomboy, because I mean Sarah is girly and she likes to get her nails done, hair did, and all that sort of stuff." and makeup and everything else and i said it's gonna be funny if we have a girl and she's a tomboy well now we have maggie and she is a complete and total diva so uh that's that's who she is and so we shouldn't shy away from those things uh we should hone in on those things and try to instill biblical values in them along the way so that's really again the importance i think of a profile study when we look at individual families we see individual differences and in how we're all unique and we're created differently but that's all right uh, i mean as long as we are striving for uh striving for our family our children and our grandchildren to be rooted in the word and to be guided by the holy spirit in whatever it is they feel led to do whatever it is that god leads them to do um then then we can I think we can celebrate that with with being rooted with biblical values. So <clears throat> they talk about the difference. Um, Tom and his wife Kim share just a little bit about their um, their differences and what they bring to the table, basically with their own family. Again, that's that's another reason to go and do that enneagram study. Uh, and it, the link is on session two on the session two video for an enneagram. Nine different personality types, and it's just a a short test to you know kind of determine what personality type you are and strengths weaknesses that sort of thing but then i love the the link that i sent y'all because it it's um uh, more biblically rooted they try to they try to guide you scripturally and how to grow in your relationship with christ based on your personality type so it's really helpful um but then they go through and they explain their children and how their children are different uh isn't it interesting how kids can grow up in a relatively close of a time period in the same household with the same parents, but they could turn out so different. And I know you've probably seen that in your own home, and you see that in so many other people's homes. Uh, again, that just shows, I think that is a biblical quality that we're all created in the image of God, and we have the capacity to think abstractly. We have things that we're interested in. We have things that we empathize with. And uh, so that's a part of uh, what God has gifted us with in creation is he's given us the ability to think about different things that that really shape and mold our personality in a lot of ways. So they uh, talk about their individual children. Uh, they have one named Connor, and he was, when this book was written, he was uh, in his teenage years and enjoys music, playing piano, um, and he's he's not shy about it, and he's uh, very um, very active in music. Then their son Matthew is uh, very active in sports, and so is uh, academic, but then also uh, also committed to sports and activities. Their daughter Erin, uh, they identify as their firstborn and a perfect angel, freely dresses, doll houses, pinks and, and purples, and lots of craft supplies filled her bedroom. So anyways, um, every one of them different and unique, and, and that's all right. Uh, I think as well, we have to be mindful of this, that there are certain guardrails that as parents we need to put up and we need to guide our children, especially as they're younger and they're not able to make certain decisions. Now, I, I believe they can kind of show you what they're interested in and the things that they're interested in. But one of the uh, one of the horrible byproducts of our society, I believe, in the day and age in which we live is that children at a very, very, very young age are able to make or are allowed to make decisions that they have no ability or capacity to comprehend the implications of those decisions. And so it's it's mind-boggling to me. Honestly, it's, this is not a popular topic, but it's mind-boggling to me that children are allowed to make decisions that impact their own gender uh, or their own 
biology even as you know we're talking about sex change surgeries and all of these different things so it is important for them to be their own person and it is important for their individuality to be explored but there are there are also guardrails biblically that are there uh, that are important that, that we should be guiding our children through and um, and I think we pray about that we study the Bible together and we 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 see our values biblically our values be shaped by the Bible rather than our own personal just our own personal experiences and I think that's really important uh, to understand what those guardrails really are and uh, to understand the danger of not necessarily falling through with those guardrails we we should be on one hand embracing the individuality of our children and our grandchildren but on the other hand also recognizing and understand understanding that it is our job to protect them and to guide them and uh, in some ways that means making certain decisions for them uh, until they have the capacity the mental capacity to understand the implications of those decisions and uh, when they when they grow up, hopefully, as Proverbs twenty two tells us, uh, that they won't depart from those things that they've been taught at a young age. Um, so again, I I just think that's important when we think about our own individual families. <clears throat> but then he also talks about his wife and how um, how she's gifted in certain areas and how they balance each other out. But one thing that they really that they mentioned that I think is is so important. They said this. They said although we had high standards for their behavior. We encourage them to express their individuality and pursue their own interests. And so there should be, you know, a standard that is there for our children and our grandchildren and our families. And, and we should encourage them to reach and to aim high with those standards, especially biblical values. Those standards should be there. But we should also encourage them to express their individuality, to pursue their own interest, as, as uh, Tom Blackaby says here. I thought this was interesting. They said, we've never posted rules on the refrigerator and didn't hand out rewards for good behavior. Uh, we are a family driven by love for one another. Now, again, I, I think that is definitely an application that, that could change from house to house. Uh, I think there are definitely children who uh, need need to be rewarded for good behavior and that's a part of guiding them and leading them in that process there are children that need rules <laughs> and they need them posted on the refrigerator um, i think that that's definitely something that we have to consider uh, but then also i mean as as a family i think those are things that you have to you have to make a decision on i mean we've got basically three rules uh, that we formed we haven't honestly enforced it, enforced them all that well but um, there are things that we talked about as Jack was growing up. Eventually, we'll talk to Maggie about those things, uh, to be kind, uh, to be respectful, and to always be a helper. And um, even, if we didn't, even if we didn't drive home those exact rules, they're not on a refrigerator or whatever, those are you know, the general values that we hope our kids will embrace uh, concerning their behavior, and especially within the home, but with everybody else. Uh, to be kind, uh, to be respectful, and to be a helper. And really, I, I think that'll probably be with them uh, even through older stages uh, as they get into adolescence and that sort of thing. Hopefully, we still strive for the same things concerning their behavior. They had a couple of rules, though, some general things that they wrote down that they really did try to instill in their children as far as their behavior is concerned. Show respect toward one another. Um, and, you know, the, so there shouldn't be name calling, lying, stealing, bullying, uh, uh, unreasonable teasing or sarcasm, that sort of thing. And they enforce those things when, when they uh, fail to reach those expectations. Uh, family takes priority. And so they encourage their children to support each other's, other's interests and activities as much as possible. We talked about that last week. Uh, number three, they said God is the center of our home. Uh, I loved what they put here. Again, this is piggybacking on some of what we talked about last week. The debate in our home was never about whether we would go to church or not, but about what was appropriate to wear when we arrived. I asked Erin, their daughter recently, why she never resisted going to church when she was younger, and she replied, I never knew that was an option. So I think that that really is 
true that if we instill that in our children, especially at a young age, uh, that's just normal for them. That's what they'll grow to expect over a period of time. We have to recognize this, that our children not only have habits, we help to form habits in our children. And so the habits that we help to form and enforce are the habits that they're going to eventually adopt. It might take longer for some kids, but I do think that over time that's true. <clears throat> we can't just say, well, that's just what our kids do. That's the habit that they're already used to. <clears throat> well, as a parent, we should help to form different habits in our children. And so I think that's uh, true for church, and uh, they, they made that uh, central to what they were talking about. Number four, home is a safe place. People are always welcome in our home. Uh, they said many of our children's friends come from broken homes or families in which the parents are at work when the children arrive home from school. So they would reach out to other other kids, and, and their home was a safe place for, for kids. Uh, five, dinner time is important. We value eating together as a family, and only recently as our kids' work and basketball schedules interfered have dinner times been missed. Um, I will, you know, I'll be honest, it's a lot easier now to prioritize dinner time now that we're quarantined and, you know, that we're social distancing and that sort of thing. Now that there's not as much going on and sporting activities and other activities and stuff that's going on, um, it has been a lot easier to prioritize dinner time. But I'm hoping and praying, you know, that we still prioritize that even when school starts back up and things get back to normal, hopefully. You know, we'll still prioritize dinner time. We we do typically still eat at the table. I mean, I think that's I think that's important. That was instilled in me uh, with my dad, and and I think that that is that is really critical. Uh, we always, when I was a kid, growing up with with my mom, we always uh, had dinner together, and it was an important time in our evening. And I, I think I think it is still important. It should still be important for us today, no matter how busy or hectic things may become. Um, and so they, they said this. They said whenever one of our family members was absent from dinner, they were missed. I think it is a good opportunity to really connect with, with your kids and connect with your spouse. Uh, number six, strive for good character. They expected their kids to honor the curfew, be trustworthy and honest, and stick to their convictions. Uh, and number seven, we're a family. Everyone helps out. Um, so doing laundry, cleaning up, washing dishes, vacuuming, contributing something to the family. And I think, I think that's important uh, as well. Number eight, clear communication is important. Uh, and so being able to keep communication lines open between you and your spouse and between uh, parents and children, being able to talk about things that need to be discussed, Nine, try to make a difference in other people's lives. I love what they said about this. And I think, I think you can grow so much as a family by prioritizing this. They said, uh, I don't want to raise selfish, self-centered children. And when I see that sinister trait creeping in, I address it quickly. And I think that is something we definitely need to prioritize in our children and in our grandchildren. Yeah, you want to... You know, so many times we want to treat them so good, and we want to we want to want them to have a, a wonderful experience and have a wonderful childhood. And in our attempt at giving them a good childhood, there is the possibility that we raise spoiled kids. And um, now, I mean, your definition of spoiled is going to change depending on <laughs> depending on probably what era you grew up in, but. Uh, nonetheless, you don't want to have selfish people. You, you I mean you want them to be people of good character, and you want them to be selfless in how they treat other people. And so, you know, it, while it may be tempting to give them everything that they want, or for them to have a magical Christmas and a magical birthday, and and to you know for everything to go well in their life and all of these things, um, what that could lead to if it's not if it's not reined in, is that they do become selfish and self-centered. And, you know, one example, many of you, uh, if you're, you know, part of our church, you know this, but, you know, this past year we we decided to ask Jack and Maggie uh, that we're going to, instead of them getting a bunch of toys for their birthday parties, we talked to them about 
collecting an offering. I know, preacher's kid, right? Collecting an offering. <clears throat> but we talked about them about people donating instead of buying a toy, bringing some money to their uh, birthday party and donating it to people who need it. Um, Maggie uh, donated money to the pregnancy center here in Cedar Town. Life matters. And then Jack, uh, his money went to buy, um, I think it was to buy clothing and some things for kids that are in the foster care system. And so, you know, Maggie didn't quite understand, but I thought we, we've decided to go ahead and do it to try to instill this in them. They've got tons of toys and, and they've got people that love them and care for them. And I'm so thankful for all of those people that, that buy them stuff. And, and we've bought them stuff, of course, over the years, but it's just overwhelming over you know, a certain period of time where they've got so many toys. Matter of fact, we've got nine storage bins in our garage, not in their rooms or in the playroom, nine storage bins of toys in our garage. And so we just said, we think you know that this is a good thing for them to give this money uh, to somebody who who would need it in some circumstance. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, Jack wasn't too fond of it at first, um, and we had to decide. You know, is this a teachable moment, or is this something where we allow him to have certain gifts? Now, I mean, uh, some people in our family did still give them gifts and that sort of thing, and and that's un- understandable. And uh, we got them a gift for their birthday, but most people instead donated. And and we stuck to just trying to, um, for Jack, for this to be a teachable moment, we stuck to uh, giving that money away. And I, I hope and I pray that that is, is helpful in the years to come. Those sorts of things are helpful in not raising spoiled brats. I mean, if anything else that comes out of the Carter household, I just don't want our kids to be self-centered. And I hope that they're Christ honoring in what they do. So that should, I think, be important for all of us. But a couple of questions they ask, what, sh- what would you like your family to look like 10 years from now? What specific actions are you taking to make that a reality? So there is where we are now and where our children are and where we are as individuals. But then there is where do we want to be in 10 years? And think about the age of your children in 10 years or the age of your grandchildren in 10 years. Where will they be? What circumstances of life will they be facing? And are they going to be prepared for those circumstances? I mean, you know, 10 years may seem like a long time but it's it's not especially i think in raising children and and raising and and being helpful in raising grandchildren and all of these things i mean 10 years jack will be 16 getting his license and he's going to be facing a whole host of other issues uh that he's not facing now maggie you know will be uh 12 and so i mean there's going to be a lot of other things that should be facing then and what do we want that to look like i mean what do you want your own children your own families to look like 10 years from now do you number two do you need to make any changes in how your children or their parents relate to one another to head off troubles in the coming years to think ahead of time and to think abstractly what is it that we could be facing now none of us know the future but i mean there are general trends that tend to repeat themselves i mean there are things that uh, most children and adolescents experience and struggle with. There are things that you can look back on in your own life and think, what did I struggle with when I was at that age? And so some of these trends, they tend to repeat themselves and they tend to, uh, they tend to pop back up when they get into that season of life. Number three, what's one thing you really like about your family relationships? What's one thing that needs to change in your home to increase love and respect for one another? Uh, to think about the good things uh, that you love and to think about the things that need some improvement on. All right, chapter six. I want to get into this because there's more material, there's more information here. Chapter six is the seven are the seven realities of experiencing God. Again, this is more of a general overview of what Henry Blackaby wrote about experiencing God uh, many years ago. He wrote he his his Basically, his whole book is about the seven, these seven realities of experiencing God. They are doing an overview in chapter 6, and then the rest of this book is about applying those in the home. So, uh, seven realities. What are the things that we should be looking for 
to experience experience God in our homes. So, so much of this is shaped by their own personal lives. We talked about that a couple weeks ago with Henry Blackaby being led to Canada to go and to basically replant a church that had about 10 people in it. And then, you know, over the years, uh, it grew and God blessed his ministry. His family was blessed as a result. And uh, his family uh, grew in their own personal walks with the Lord and their own spiritual devotion. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but but then also it's it's important, you know, they, they mentioned that uh, these realities just come from really intense biblical study. And, um, and it's just straight from the Bible. And so that's, we should be shaped by that first and foremost. So pay attention to the scriptural references in chapter seven, um, because, or excuse me, in chapter six, because uh, we need to go back to these scriptural references and to study these, do it in your own you know, devotional time. These are so important. But number one, reality number one of experiencing God is God is always at work around you. God is always at work around you. They say eternal God has been working through the ages to accomplish his divine purposes. And so ins and outs from different eras, different circumstances, different people. You know, you think about there's 7 billion people on the face of this earth today. But think about all the billions of people that have existed all throughout human history. And God has always been at work in every single time period. Now, I mean, you can look at... Say, for instance, um, you can look at the 400 years where God was silent in between the Old Testament and the New Testament before Jesus comes as the Messiah. Um, but, you know, God is still God even in that moment. Even though he was silent in his communication directly to Israel, um, and that, you know, is, is definitely worth considering and thinking about the coming Messiah. But God was still on the throne. He did not abdicate his authority in that time. So God is always at work around you. Um, and I think that's, that's so important. So when humanity sinned and rebelled against him, God initiated a redemptive plan to restore people into a relationship with him once more. Uh, and so he's always been actively, actively working in the lives of individuals and in uh, the lives of humanity as a whole. So uh, they, they reference this. He is constantly working to draw people to himself through the activity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is alive and active and is moving from person to person. Uh, and he's drawing, the Holy Spirit is drawing people to himself. God uses circumstances to bring people to a place where they call upon him for help and guidance. And so God helps to orchestrate certain circumstances. He uses other circumstances uh, for his glory and for our benefit and our good. Uh, God is always at work convicting people of their sins so they seek salvation and freedom. When we talk about salvation, that is, that's so important in understanding the, the role that God plays because it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sin and helps us to draw into the presence of God. And God is still in the business of saving sinners. God's still in the business of offering salvation, of convicting hearts. God is always working to conform believers into the image of his son. If you're a believer, you're a work in progress. Uh, God's still working on you. He's still working on me. And, I, and, and thank goodness he's, he's not done with me. <laughs> you know, I got so many areas where I need to grow. And uh, he's still working to conform believers into the image of his son. God works through people to share the gospel with those who have not heard it. God's Holy Spirit is helping believers know uh, what they should pray for. So even in those moments where it doesn't seem like God as, is as active in our life as he has been in the past, he is still at work. I love that song, Waymaker. Our choir sings and so many other churches have sang it. Uh, and they say this in the middle of the song, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when, you know, no matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in, he's always making a way for us. They said the most important factor in our world is not what we are doing, but what God is accomplishing. We try to measure success and we try to measure progress based on what we've done and what we're able to do. Um, but really it should be, we should 
pay more attention to what God is accomplishing, what he is doing, because he is active. He is at work in our lives and in the lives of others. Oswald Chambers said, spiritual insight does not so much enable us to understand God as to understand that he is at work in the ordinary things of life in the ordinary stuff human nature is made of. So we should find the miracle in the ordinary. You know, we, we look to those super spiritual moments in our life and we say, yeah, I know God was at work there. I know God really moved and he really did something wonderful and amazing in my life. But listen, it's Wednesday. God woke you up. God gave you breath to breathe. God gave you the opportunity to experience this day. That is a miracle of its, in and of itself. And God was working actively in your life today. It may not seem like it as much, but, but God <clears throat> is very active in what he's doing in your life. <clears throat> so uh, Philippians 1 tells us that what God begins, he completes He's still working on all, of, on all of us. And what a wonderful thing that is. Reality number two, God invites you into a love relationship with himself. You want to experience God, we should understand this reality. He is inviting us into a love relationship with himself. Um, all that we know about love comes from God. And they add, it doesn't come from Hollywood. It comes from God. He invented it. God is love. That's clear scripturally. And so if we want to have a relationship with God, if we want to understand what love truly is and how that impacts our own lives, we've got to realize and understand that God is inviting us into a love relationship with him so that we can experience and understand love in the best, uh, most biblical, purest sense of the word. So they said the Bible provides the historic record of God reaching out to people with love in the hope that they would respond back to him in a like manner. A uh, couple of things they mentioned. We should never question God's love for us because that was settled once and for all on the cross. And that is obviously the prime example, the, the greatest example of love. As Jesus says, the greatest example of love is, is those that if you lay down your life for your friends. And, and Jesus laid down his life for us. It says we should never question whether or not God's plan for us is in our best interest since he only acts toward us in ways that reflect perfect love. The only way that I know how to love others is because God has loved me first. The only way that I could ever experience love in any sense of the word is because I have been loved by a sovereign and a holy God. Now, we may think that we love other people if we're unbelievers, and we may think, well, I, I mean, I, of course I love so-and-so. If, if, if so-and-so, is not, if they're not a believer, they, they may think that they know what love is because they've heard about love or they've seen it on TV or they've read about it in books or they've you know, heard people talking about it. But I don't think you could ever, ever fully understand love in the truest sense until you experience the love of God. And, um, and that's important. They, they said this, God could have created human beings with the same capacity for love as lizards, cows, or vultures. Instead, God built within each of us the innate desire to love and to be loved. And so it's a part of our human experience that we, that we pursue the heart of God in this, but, but it's really something that is a gift from God in and of himself, something that he gives to us. As he loves us, we can in turn love other people. All right, reality number three, God invites you to become involved with him in his work. Um, and I, th- I think this is you know, one of the uh, lasting legacies of experiencing God is this particular idea. You find where God is at work and you join him there. You join him in that work. So often, we try to initiate a work of our own and ask for God to bless it when the reality is we need to look and see what God is already doing and find what God is doing and join him there in what he is doing. So I said this, God is not merely a doctrine to believe. He is a person who wants you to be involved with him in his eternal work. 
And that's important in the context of the church. When we think about ministries and we think about discipleship, when we think about evangelism and investing in other people. We, it's, you know, it's, it's important that we realize where God is at work in his church and we try to join him there in that rather than just trying to start something on our own and asking God to bless it. And, um, you know, I, I, think that's, I think that's important in our volunteer work in the church. I think that's important in our own personal lives and our families. You know, just to, just to pay attention, to be cognizant and aware of what is it that God is doing. So as God, they say this, as God works in the world around you, he will invite you to join in his activity. They give several different examples in scripture. God invited Adam to participate in the naming of the animal kingdom he had created. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I, I'm always really interested in that in the Genesis account. When when God creates Adam and then he creates all the all the animals and everything else that roams the earth, and God says, all right, Adam, why don't you name it? Uh, and why don't you name those things? It, already you see the relationship between creator and creation that is starting to exist there. And it's there's still an element of that that, that still exists to this day, right? That, that God gives us personal responsibility. He gives us the ability uh, to steward certain aspects of his creation. And it doesn't mean it own, that, that we belong, or it doesn't mean that we own it or that it is ours, uh, but it does mean that God gives us a certain amount of responsibility. He started a work and he asked for you to come and join him on that work. Uh, God asked Noah to adjust his family to the cataclysmic judgment he was bringing upon the earth. God invited Abraham to leave his country to join God's activity in creating a holy people. God invited Moses to leave his shepherding business and join him in freeing a nation of slavery. Uh, God invited Joshua to join him in claiming the promised land. God invited Mary and Joseph to participate in the raising of the Messiah. God invited fishermen to join in his redemptive work. God invited Paul to join him in taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And so the question for us today is, is simply this. What is God inviting you to do? in your homes, uh, but then also in, uh, in your own sphere of influence, in your community, in your church. Uh, what is God actively doing and what is he inviting you to do in that journey and in that process? So critically important to understanding and experiencing the presence of God. Not just praying for God to give you a sign or praying for, you know, what is it that God you want me to do? How many times have I asked that question? Oh man, I've asked that question so many times to God. And in in, in my mind frame, my, the spiritual uh, state that I was in probably wasn't right. Instead of asking God, God, what do you want me to do? Sometimes we should ask God, God, what is it that you're already doing that you want me to join you in doing? And, um, you know, you can read the original experience in God to say to go into more detail about that. But reality number four, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. So there's a lot there, and we need to unpack this a little bit. Reality number four to experience in God. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. So, uh, there is, I think, an important idea that underlines all of this. Uh, <clears throat> number one is, God has spoken, and he has spoken clearly through his Bible and through the word of God that we have. Genesis to Revelation, 66 different books, all inspired by God and brought into existence by human instruments, human, human writers that God used through the Holy Spirit to communicate these ideas clearly to us. And I believe that the Bible is inerrant, inspired in the original manuscripts. It is without error at all. And so uh, we should go to it as our God uh, for faith and practice in all things. Um, but then God also does uh, give us direction. He instills in us discernment through his Holy Spirit. I believe that God speaks to us in certain ways. And we're going to talk about that here in just, here in just a minute. Uh, but all of these things, no matter how God speaks to you or impresses things on your heart, all of these things should be rooted in Scripture. 
It should be rooted in the Bible and what God has said. It doesn't negate anything that the Holy Spirit does in your life or leads you to do in your life, um, but it, it can help to reinforce you know, what God is, is speaking to you. Now, of course, you've probably heard it said, and I think it's, it's so true, God will never tell you something uh, that contradicts his word. So, if that is true, and I believe that it is true, God will never impress something on your heart. God will never speak to you and tell you something that is uh, that is contradicting what he has already said in Scripture. Then we have to know this, that God does speak primarily through Scripture. And, uh, um, and we should go to Scripture to understand what God has said. But... Here's a critical role that the Holy Spirit plays today. The Holy Spirit plays the critical role of applying Scripture to our lives. And who better to apply the Scriptures than the author of Scriptures? We can't forget that. The Holy Spirit really, truly is the author of Scripture. And so uh, who better to understand the nature of Scripture than the one who authored it? And who better to apply principles of Scripture to our lives than the person of the Holy Spirit? So it is uh, important when we think about how God speaks to us because it is through application of God's Word. And it is also also a part of two-way communication. Us praying to God and God responding to us. And us listening to how God responds. So... They say, you know, part of the uh, role of the Holy Spirit, depending on your particular need, the Holy Spirit will be your God, your comforter, your advocate, your defender, and your friend. And the Holy Spirit can fulfill all of those functions in our lives. So let's, I mean, let's look and kind of unpack this a little bit because this is important, especially when we talk about our homes and how we apply this in our homes, which is what we're going to get to in the coming weeks. God's Spirit will speak to you through the pages of the Bible. God's Word is not just something that was written a long time ago. It's not ancient and antiquated. You know, it's not just it's not just a history book. I mean, I love history, but but God's Word is so different than any other book ever written in the history of humanity. It is alive and active. And so God's Word is with us today, and the Holy Spirit uses it to uh, guide us, to convict us, uh, to convict us of our sin, to point us to the truthfulness of the gospel. And so as we read God's Word, as we study God's Word, we're not just reading stories that happened a long time ago, uh, although we have plenty of examples in Scripture of that. What we're doing when we're reading the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is actively working in our lives to apply Scripture. And how amazing that is. I mean, I can read one verse that I've read 200 times or whatever, and, and God just helps to, helps to apply it in a different way, in a different light. Does it change the original meaning of Scripture? No. I mean, I believe that there is, God has really one intention when he wrote Scripture and how it's to be interpreted. I don't believe, you know, multiple interpretations or whatever. We, we can have disagreements over what Scripture means, uh, but God doesn't disagree with himself. He doesn't contradict himself. And so uh, while there are some scriptures that we don't completely understand, I believe we can rest in the fact that God understands it and he's not conflicted about any passages of scripture. But <clears throat> the Holy Spirit does apply scripture to our lives. And sometimes it can be done in a different way, um, depending on the circumstances and, and where we are and what we're faced with and how the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us as we read the Bible. And so uh, God will speak to you through the pages of the Bible. Every time you open your Bible, this is what they say, be prepared for God to speak directly into your life. Um, that's so, so important in how we lead our families and how we are led in our own personal walk with the Lord. God will speak to you as you pray. And I believe that. There have been times when I have prayed and I have, um, I have been, something, you know, has been impressed on my heart. I felt led to do something, especially, you know, big milestone moments in my life when I prayed about uh, asking Sarah to marry me. Um, you know, I felt led by God and I felt a response from God as he pressed it on my heart to 
ask Sarah to marry me. By the way, encourage your kids and your grandkids to pray about who they're going to marry. Somebody say amen and amen. Right? These are this is a this is a prayerful decision that we should make, and we should pray for God to give us guidance to respond to us in making some of those decisions. When I felt led into ministry, um, that was a prayerful decision where I prayed to God and I asked God to give me an answer, and I felt like He did speak to me as I prayed. Was it a, a clear, audible voice? I'm not not really. I mean, that's just the way I experienced it. But but I did felt led by God when we prayed to come to Second Baptist. It was clear. I mean, we went into the parking lot to pray uh, several nights in a row, and we tried to go late at night when <laughs> nobody was there. But we took our kids with us, and we didn't want to run into anybody because we're you know just in the process of praying about it, and um, and and. As a family, you know, we just felt led. We felt God impressed it on our heart to uh, to pray. Uh, and I think I think that's important that God does speak to us as we pray. Uh, prayer. They said this prayer is not primarily a time for you to convince God to do something about your concerns. Rather, it is a sacred where God impresses upon your heart that which is on His heart. So prayer is not a laundry list of telling God, this is all the things I want you to do, God. Prayer is understanding the heart of God and aligning your heart with His. Understanding what is a priority to God and how that applies to your life and how God is leading you in your own circumstances of life. So uh, God will speak to you as you pray. God speaks to you through the circumstances of life. Uh, God does not necessarily cause every circumstance in our life, but he certainly will use them. I think that is so true that there are circumstances where it can happen to you and it could happen to your family. And you realize, you know, God is God's trying to tell me something here. He's trying to lead me here through this. Then they also say this. Um, there are there are many circumstances you face for which there is no scripture verse that speaks directly to that issue. Uh, that's when you must rely on the Holy Spirit to take Scripture and apply it specifically to your situation. So again, the best person to interpret Scripture is the Holy Spirit. Now, we should allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. We should search the Bible to find answers to biblical questions. But the best, really, applier of Scriptures to our lives is the author of Scripture himself, the Holy Spirit. God speaks to the church body. Um, and I think this is important. God can use individuals within the church to help confirm you know, what God is doing in your life or to confirm a, a, a decision that you're praying about. And uh, maybe that person realizes it. Maybe they don't realize it at all how God is using them. But they were just at the right place at the right time and they said the right things. And it just felt, you know, God is God was answering your prayer through that other person. So what's critically important to this is that uh, God did not create us to be independent, but interdependent. And we are interdependent on others. Real quickly, because I got to go to the next, um, got to go to the next few ones, and I don't want to go over too much past eight o'clock. All of these ways are valid in how God speaks to us. But we should also take note of this, that um, our own experiences, uh, other people, and God answering our prayers could be subject really to our own interpretations. And so what I mean by that is we might feel a certain way. Maybe God, we feel like God is speaking to us in this way. And that's why we have to stay rooted in Scripture. That's why we have to stay studied up in Scripture. Uh, because it's it's less ambiguous when God speaks through His Word. And uh, it doesn't mean that God doesn't speak to us through multiple ways, but, but it, it can become clearer through Scripture what God is actually saying to us. And uh, we should utilize that in how God speaks to us. Reality number five, real quickly, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief 
that requires faith and action. So what they mean by a crisis of belief is a moment when you're confronted with a decision of whether or not you will trust God and obey what he says. God initiates God-sized endeavors is what they say. So an invitation for you to join God in his work is going to lead you to make a decision. Am I going to obey him uh, or am I going to obey and trust what God has said and what he wants me to do? So several different examples in scripture that they uh, list out. But what's important is that this is cumulative and grow in our faith. Each step of faith we take builds on the foundation of the previous steps that we have taken. Each step of faith that we take builds on the foundation of the previous steps that we have taken. Reality number six, you must make adjustments, major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. So we have to be willing to adjust, willing to change, and uh, willing to adapt to what God is doing in our lives. And they, they say this, um, if you're going to move from where you are to where God wants you to be, you must make adjustments. There's going to be times when God really moves and deals with us in the uncomfortable periods of our lives. That is so applicable, I think, with our children and with our own families. Uh, there are times when God moves so much in those periods that are stressful, in those periods that are uncomfortable, in those periods that are, are, um, are hard to get through. We shouldn't forget God is still at work in those moments, still at work in those, period, in those periods of life. Too many Christians are trying to accomplish God's work using their methods, and that simply doesn't work. So recognize God has his own way of doing things. And he is going to use his own methods in moving in our lives depending on what the circumstances are. And we have to adjust our schedule to his. We shouldn't expect God to adjust his schedule to us. I mean, we shouldn't adjust, we shouldn't ask God to adjust his methods for our sake. He's God. He's Lord. He's master, sovereign over all. And so a part of experiencing his presence is realizing where God is and trying to align ourselves with him, trying to align ourselves with his plan, his purposes, and, uh, and his methods. Reality number seven, you come to know God by experience as you obey him and he, is, and he accomplishes his work through you. So we experience God in obedience, now that's not always that's not always comforting because sometimes what God is telling us to obey him in sometimes those are things that we don't really enjoy but that's how we experience God that's how we grow in our faith when we obey God when we read his word and we study who he is and what he wants us to do the standards he wants us to live by and when we pray and we ask God to answer us and to guide us through the Holy Spirit and to use our circumstances to guide us and to, to lead us. We obey him. That's how we grow in our faith. And at times it's incremental. At times it's, it's small things that God is doing in our lives that we obey him in the small things. They, said, they say this, and I think this is, this is so central to our own individual lives as Christians, but then how we lead our families. I hope and I pray that we have a family that prioritizing that prioritize prioritizes obeying God, listening and heeding to his commands. Said so obedience is the doorway to experiencing God. Obedience is the doorway to experiencing God. Not some sort of mystical phenomenon. Uh, not just simply prayer, not just simply studying the word. Not just simply going to church or committing ourselves to Sunday school. Obedience in all things. When we grow in obedience, we grow in our relationship with God. Uh, one of the things that's important, you know, I think that we instill in our children, especially at a young age, is to obey their parents. That's biblical. <clears throat> It's one of the Ten Commandments, and we've had to, we've pulled that out of our hat a few times, and I hope that you've pulled that out of your hat as well. Uh, we've used that with our kids sometimes and told them, you know, God wants you to obey your parents. Uh, and amazingly, 
our kids have started to grow and adapt and have a high view of God. I mean, a very high view of God. And I, we should instill that in our children. As they study the Bible, as they pray, we should, it, it, we should reiterate that time and time again. God is powerful. God is the most powerful person you could ever possibly imagine. He is Lord. He's master over all. He's king of kings. And uh, we should have a high view. We should instill that in our children and our grandchildren for them to have a high view of God. And uh, so there are times, you know, we've utilized that to our advantage. We've said, you know, well, you need to obey your parents because God said to obey your parents. And that has become a major part, a fundamental part of kind of who our kids are. And Jack will reference that sometimes, you know, to honor your father and your mother. If he, do, if he does something nice for us, sometimes he'll say, Daddy, I just honored you. <laughs> And so, you know, that should be somewhat of a priority. Uh, obedience should, uh, but especially to God. And then they said this, you know, talking about Matthew 25. If you are faithful in the little God asks of you, he will give you more. So we should be faithful in the small things. And then God will lead us to faithfulness in the larger things, the bigger things. Uh, we, we typically go to the big things in life and we say, God, I'll be obedient in those moments. But, but it's in the day-to-day, the small functions of life where we should also be obedient and we grow in our faithfulness to God. So questions for reflection. If you were to guess where your Christian life is at present, which of the realities would you say you're in right now? And why is that? So out of the seven realities... Which one do you most identify with? Number two, have you experienced God speaking to you in the past? If so, what did he tell you? Number three, were you taught that Christianity was primarily a relationship or a religion? How might you cultivate a deeper relationship with Christ than what you already have? Number four, how are you presently experiencing a crisis of belief? Remember, that's the point of decision where God has presented you what he wants you to do you make the decision, are you going to be obedient to that? If so, what are, you, uh, what are you struggling to believe God for? And then number five, are there adjustments you need to make if you, if you are to move forward in your walk with God? If so, what adjustments? What is stopping you from making those adjustments? So it's not too late, no matter where we are. Uh, we're all a work in progress. There may be things that we look back on and we say, I wish I'd have done that differently. And there's plenty of things I can think about in my own life. But we can constantly adjust and we can constantly change to become more obedient to God, to devote ourselves more fully to His will. And that'll, imp- that'll change things in our families, in our homes. And we'll talk about the application in the weeks ahead. So I hope that y'all have a great night. And uh, we'll continue our discussion online. And we will see you soon.